morning. My name is Christine. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm going to talk to you real fast about my interior design project, which was the design of a home for residents with hearing loss. The problems of deafness are deeper and more complex than those of blindness. Deafness is a much worse misfortune, for it means the loss of the most vital stimulus, the sound of the voice that brings language, sets thoughts astir, and keeps us in the intellectual company of man. Or to put a little bit more simply, to be blind separates us from things, to be deaf separates us from people. Although Helen Keller was speaking exclusively of deafness when she made this comparison, she very succinctly comes to the crux of what it means to lose one's hearing. And losing one's hearing is the loss of the most basic sense of communication between people and is largely ignored in the field of interior design. So a couple quick statistics for you before I get in too deep. 15% of American adults report some trouble hearing. Now this is adults 18 plus. This is not strictly seniors and it is only people who report it. This does not count towards people who think it's nothing, it's nothing I can live with, it's not that big of a deal. Of those who report disabling hearing, 25% are 65 plus, they are seniors. They remain the most recognized portion of those who suffer from hearing loss. And I think one of the most telling statistics that I found from the National Institute of Health was that a third of people, particularly those 65 or older, would not use a hearing aid if they had the chance. Now, hearing aids are a pain in the butt. They are expensive. Insurance does not want to pay for them, and they're annoying to get. But to have someone say, even if all of that was taken care of, I wouldn't use it, I think is very telling about the way that hearing loss is perceived. So this project specifically deals with partial hearing loss for several different reasons. Um, the big one being deafness and partial hearing loss are two completely different animals and require very different things from designers. Deafness is relatively definitive. It is the absence of sound from one's life. There are codes and regulations that are set into place to help deal with deafness on a whole, although those are mostly for safety and navigation rather than communication. Partial hearing loss affects more people. It's a little bit trickier to deal with because there are acoustical considerations that would not necessarily affect a deaf resident. And this is going to sound a little bit silly, but the loss of hearing is a loss. It is something that people perceive as absent from their life or as a disability, which is not always the case with deafness. American Sign Language is a language. There is a culture that surrounds people who are deaf that they celebrate as a certain sense of individuality that is not found in people with partial hearing loss. So partial hearing loss has some very significant psychological effects on residents, usually social. People who experience partial hearing loss will avoid social interactions in order to avoid confronting disability. It leads to isolation, to social anxiety. There is a self-stigma involved with hearing loss where they see themselves as broken or abnormal. Now just take a minute to imagine someone in your life who is a child, a friend, a grandparent, who's outgoing and vivacious and loves being around people and just stops because they think that they are broken, that there is something wrong with them, that they will be judged for it. So the public spaces don't generally address partial hearing loss. The codes are vague enough that they could be, but it's not required and designers generally don't look at it. The purpose of this project was to create a safe haven, a place where someone with partial hearing loss can go and have that weight lifted off them and not deal with the stressors of their disability. In terms of design, this means understanding communication between people with partial hearing loss and their environment and understand sound and what that means to those residents. So communication among people with partial hearing loss, visibility is absolutely key. People with any degree of hearing loss, be it a little or a lot, need to be able to see the world around them. They need to see who they are talking to. Maybe they speak sign language, maybe they read lips, maybe they just need to know your body language. They know you well enough that they can tell when you're mad just by how you're standing. The other big aspect to this was the kind of junk noise that happens in the background. They need to be able to, excuse me, to focus on the conversation that is at hand. They can't have the AC droning on in the background distracting them. It acts as a stressor. And so minimal junk noise from background noise, HVAC, washer, dryer, exterior sounds from the street, as well as intrusive noise from adjacent spaces. 
So the kind of quick and dirty of how sound works. This particular graph comes from a book by Egan on architectural acoustics. It looks at the different way that ceilings affect sound. The short version is sound emits from a source, bounces off something, comes back. That reverberation and echo can be very disorienting to someone with hearing loss because they can't tell where sounds are coming from. So the ideal for designing space that minimizes that, you want as much sound absorption as possible. You want someone talking in this area to be talking in this area, intrude upon another space. So this is ultimately the design I came up with. This is a single story home, so there's no intrusion from the second story. There's no one walking overhead. There's no one dropping anything. So there's no noise intrusion of any kind. The front porch is here. It is a two bedroom, one and a half bath house. It is very, very small, very minimal. And the idea was to maximize visibility while minimizing the amount of sound intrusion. So you have a line of sight, but not a line of sound. So visibility comes in the form of angles. From here, you can see into here. From here, you can see into here. Here, 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 here. So I also have for you an annotated plan. <laughs> I will cover the annotations. Do not worry about reading it. And so the angles, in addition to providing clear lines of sight, also help buffer the sound. The more times a sound wave bounces off something, the less volume it's going to have coming back. Noise from the street bounces into this wall, which is lined with an acoustical material, which prevents it from intruding farther into the space. The same over here. There is acoustical treatment there and there. Sound from the kitchen bounces there. It's not going to intrude back into the homes. Space planning was a huge consideration. Mechanical and kitchen is all the way over here, so, and this is an acoustical wall as well. So this noise is not going to intrude into this space. Overhead cabinets block sound waves from coming in this way. The living room is its own little island here. It's actually two steps up. So being, being at a raised elevation traps that sound in that eight foot space rather than a nine foot space where it can intrude farther into inwards. The materials for the space are all soft materials. The main flooring is a cork floor because cork is not perforated, but because it has those air pockets, it has the same noise absorption carpet, which is much better than a hardwood or a tile. The only places is not the case is where I use carpet, such as the living room, the bedroom, the office, and in the kitchen. You can't use cork in a kitchen no matter how much you want to buffer the sound. Reality does not accommodate that. So I did also want to go in. These are the final deliverables for the space. I did some visual renderings in Revit. This is into the kitchen. As you can see, the overhead cabinets are there to help kind of buffer that sound. The kitchen is one of the high noise areas in the home, pots and pans, kitchen, people talking, people on the phone, all that kind of stuff. The finishes on a whole I tried to keep very warm and very inviting to help create that sense of safety. Here are two more views for you. This is from the kitchen looking into the foyer. As you can see, I mentioned before, the living room is two steps up. It's just a little, it's not enough to be a hindrance. And you can see here we have coffered ceilings all throughout. So above the dining, above the living, above the kitchen. So the sound bounces upward, bounces around in the ceiling. It still comes back down. You can still hear what's going on, but it's not going to be intrusive. And this last rendering I have here is of the foyer entry. This, as I mentioned earlier, the acoustical wall that improves kind of that sound absorption coming from the street. I did take into some consideration the landscaping of the space. The whole house is built of thermosteel panels. They are a green material. They're made of steel and polystyrene. They are prefabricated in, here in Virginia. And in, additional, in addition to saving you a lot of money on energy, they're a wonderful acoustical buffer. Not a lot gets through polystyrene. The greenery as well is there in order to keep that noise intrusion from happening in the space. All in all, it was a very informative project to work on. I think I really succeeded in my goal in the space. And hopefully there are suggestions that would be useful to the design industry on a general whole. So, any questions?
Yes. So the reason why it was why two steps or why did I make it at a higher elevation? The reason it's at a higher elevation is because the living room is a high noise area. By putting it at a higher elevation, I'm able to keep that high ceiling, but keep the sound buffered between that space. Had I kept it at the same elevation, you would have a greater level of noise intrusion from that space. And part of the furniture selection, too, was that same idea of absorbing through materials. All the furniture is very deliberately soft and cushy, so anything coming from that TV is going to hit here before it travels here. Yes? There was some con There were some conversations about that in the program. Ultimately, the reason it was kept in is because we're seeing greater and greater instances of people experiencing hearing loss at a younger age. We're living in a very noisy world, and it's not getting any quieter. So it was important that it be not just usable by someone who is a senior, but by someone who is not. And providing the acoustical soundness of that space was a greater consideration. Yes. Offhand, I don't know. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the senior spaces I've seen. On, honestly, I don't. Um, a lot of the materiality is its not obvious, but it should be. <laughs> um, no, material is the only thing I can think of. I don't think there's as much consideration in terms of acoustical absorption. Honestly, a lot of spaces, particularly public spaces like a senior living, well, senior living is not a public space, but spaces that are going to have multiple residents, if they're using acoustics, they're bringing in an engineer to do the acoustics. They're not handing it to the designer or the architect. They're bringing in someone specific. And usually companies are only willing to pay for that if it's an auditorium or a lecture hall or something where acoustics are a much bigger deal. Yes. It depends. There are carpet is used a lot throughout the space, and the kitchen is a hardwood. The cork, it is resistant. It requires treatment. It requires, I mean, you have a resin on top of it that's very thick, but 